Good morning to all of you. <coughs> His Excellency Krishna Khan Paul Ji, Honorable Governor of Uttarakhand, Sri Arvind Pandey Ji, Honorable Education Minister, Sri Dani Singh Rawat Ji, Honorable Education Minister State, mm -hmm. Professor H. S. Dani, Vice Chancellor, all the dignitaries on the dais, and all of you, the toppers of the various courses in Uttarakhand. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a great privilege and honor to be present here today in an event which is quite unique in the country. Probably this is one of the first of its kind where the governor of a state is initiated an activity which brings in the interaction between students and people of eminence in the country. It's indeed a great privilege and honor to be present here and talk to you about what ISRO has done in making sure that the country progresses and it makes use of the space technology. Today, my hearty congratulations to all of those who have become toppers in their respective endeavors and also those who strive but did not succeed. Because it's not just the success that matters, it's also the effort that you put and the difference between the real success and a setback is something which we need to understand and appreciate. I would like to bring to you a kind notice that this is only a beginning for you. You are on the threshold of a great future. A future where you can make a great mark not only for yourself but also for the country and it is this that we need to remember while putting in great efforts we can achieve great individual success but individual success alone is not sufficient it's only when you make use of the knowledge and skills that you have acquired for bringing in benefits of that knowledge for the benefit of the society that you make a difference to the living. With the success you have achieved, you need to realize that you have not reached your true potential. Because it is said, for example, one of the persons said that if you have not failed so far, it's only because you have not tried hard enough and you have not set your target big enough. So what potential you have reached today definitely should remind you that you need to put in greater efforts and you need to make sure that you set your targets much higher and when you encounter setback you also realize that you need to make much greater preparation to achieve success in future. Probably you are also familiar Faraday before he made a successful bulb had tried hundreds of times and failed to achieve success but then he said that I know of 100 ways of not making this work. So, but the point is, we need to be ready for not only taking success, but also failure in our strides. If you learn from others' mistakes, then you can be called smart. But if you do not learn from your own mistakes, definitely you will be stupid. So what we need to understand is that in the growth of our life cycle, we need to make sure that we look at how things have happened and achieve success on the basis of learning from others' mistakes. Today, India is on the threshold of becoming a great country, a country which everybody else will look forward to for seeking guidance. That is a true place for India. And we are on the threshold of becoming the third largest economy. But if all this has to happen, who has to work for that? It is people like you sitting here today who have achieved some success and who are going to work for the coming decades that it is your responsibility to make sure that India tomorrow becomes a country where like many of people today long to go to Western countries. Why do they do that? Because they think the quality of life there and the standard of living is very high. But how has this come about? 
it has come about because people of that country have put their sweat and blood and ensured the status and the quality of life is great. If same thing has to happen for us in the country, in our country, do you think somebody else will come and do that work for us? Definitely not. It's only people like you and me who have to put in our sweat and blood and change the scenario in the country where people of the world want to come to India and seek whether it's information or opportunities. What I would like to narrate to you a story is going to be about an organization, an organization which started its work in the late 60s and today has made a great difference to the country and also is actually being looked at by the people across the globe. Probably all of you are familiar that way back in 1957, the Russians put an object into space, the Sputnik. At that time, the Americans and Russians were really competing with each other to demonstrate who is more powerful, who is mightier, and who has more capabilities. At that time, actually, we had a great visionary scientist in our country, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. What he was looking at is, when a new technology of space has come into being, and when it is becoming accessible, what is it that we can do with this technology to improve the status within our country and how to make use of this new technology for bringing in quick development within the country. Probably some of you are also aware that way back uh, Arthur Clark had actually shown by analysis that if you can put a satellite into an orbit at 36,000 kilometers in an equatorial plane because it takes exactly 24 hours to go around, it appears like at you can say tower at 36,000 kilometer, which can have access to one third of the globe. So like line of sight communication you can do, you can make use of this satellite at 36,000 kilometers and cover one third of the globe. What Dr. Sarabhai visualized that if we are able to put satellites into orbit, we can make use of it for looking at Earth by looking at what the cloud patterns are and then Come, come bring about information about cyclones and not only that, provide communication capability. At a time when the country had just got its independent and it was in the fledgling state, it was the vision of Dr. Sarabhai which made sure that this new technology of space was brought into the country. He conceived of an experiment which was the world's largest socio-technological experiment conducted at that point of time. Though he conceived it, he was not there to see the actual benefits of that which happened in 75 because Dr. Sarabhai passed away in 71. But by that time, he had made sure that he had established the base in the country. He made use of his friendship with Americans, Russians, Germans and French to bring in what is called as sounding rocket systems to Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Site. There is a very interesting example story in this. When he initially brought these sounding rockets from Americans and uh, Russians and French in the form of kits, it was to be launched in Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Site in the 60s. At that time, he had to make sure that the place where it was going to be launched, the beaches of Tumba, had to be vacated by the fishermen. To make this happen, he actually took the help of the priest of a church in that beach, and through the priest, he could convince the fishermen that today if you vacate this place and provide the opportunity for the scientists to conduct experiments, one day in future, the country will benefit. And as though to actually vindicate that particular thought process from 1999 onwards by making observations from the satellites launched by us, by looking at the color of the ocean and through the color identifying the chlorophyll and chlorophyll along with the temperature front, ISRO was able to provide to the fishermen information about where to go for fishing in the oceans. This alone saves to the country between 15 to 20,000 crores a year because the fisherman is now assured of his catch and he doesn't have to search for the place and the amount of petrol and diesel he spent is saved. And 
to this recently when we added our own navigation satellite series there was an additional capability which was brought in a small gadget which is fitted to the boat actually picks up information from the satellites navic satellites messages and there is an app in the mobile which provides to the fisherman in his local language the information in the form of uh, weather vagaries and also where he has to go and there is a compass which is set up in that mobile which points to him from where he is to where to go for fishing it also tells him when he cross comes anywhere near international boundaries it alerts him so though even the fisherman need not be knowing how to read or write he gets in his local language audio messages and also video information and that helps him in his uh, day to day life so the point that i was trying to say is that this space technology which was initially brought in was brought in for ensuring that the country's progress happens very quickly the first largest socio technological experiment which i was referring to was conducted in the year 1975 and what was done in that was by making use of the satellite broadcasting about 2400 villages in our country equivalent of today's direct to home television all of you can see at your home with a small antenna the direct broadcasting at your home you imagine in 1975 when the country had only four metros the privilege of looking at broadcasting in 2400 remote villages of our country using direct to community sets and borrowing a satellite which was developed by america it was moved over to the indian longitudes and for about a year the fish the farmers and the villagers were provided information about farming practices and the health practices and this is what actually convinced the government that space technology is for the benefit of the country and then the initial set of uh, insat series of satellite program was approved and the very first set of insat satellites we brought in an innovation where again we brought in what is called three in one technology broadcasting telecommunication as well as meteorology meteorology is by looking at the cloud patterns over the earth trying to track the cyclones and also being able to predict today we have a capability of actually observing from space every 15 minutes images of india and its surroundings cloud patterns vertical temperature and humidity profiles and also the information about the entire ocean wind vectors all of which is used in weather prediction and weather forecasting models not only within our country but we also provide this information to the global meteorological community we have a large number of microwave sensors the advantage of microwave sensors is like visible what we can see visually you can easily see through the glass because glass is transparent to us in visible wavelength but when you are seeing from space towards earth from june to september we have the cloud cover monsoon period so obviously clouds do not allow visible and infrared wavelength to penetrate but in microwave wavelength region the clouds appear transparent and you can make observation so today we have a number of different technology sensors looking at earth from space which enable us providing information to the meteorological community not only that today we have a set of observation capability which helps the government in visualizing what is the likely yield of major crops like rice wheat sugar cane sugar cane groundnut and jute and many of these ahead of harvest the information is provided to the government what is the yield that is going to be this year and they can plan their both in terms of procurement or export activities for the various types of crops and similarly today a large number of government programs where they make use of these satellite based data geospatial technology information mobile and navigation based information for monitoring and planning many of you are aware that government spends quite an amount of money in programs like manrega where 
a large number of activities happens across the country. Today, based on the space-based geospatial technologies, the government departments are in a position to actually bring to database and track the developments. There is a program under Bowen which actually showcases the events that are happening in the vicinity of you and you can look at what are the activities that have happened. More than three crore assets which have been brought in by this Manrega program has got into database and government is able to actually monitor. Similarly, based on the space-based information, whether it is for drilling bore wells in the country or providing information to the farmers about the soil, soil types, and also the micronutrients required for the fertilizer mix and a host of such things are being done. How has all this become possible? It's a technology, a technology which has been actually mastered by very few in the world. Today, India is among those countries which has a capability of building satellite instruments, satellites and the launch vehicle. And today, we have Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle which is considered as one of the most uh, reliable launch vehicle. And not only are we launching satellites for India, but we are also in a position to make use of our excess capacity to launch satellites for others. One of the things you saw last year, in, in a single launch, we put 104 satellites into the orbit. It was looked at by the world in a very curious way. That day on the February of last year, when we launched this, we also had in the launcher a camera which took the picture of each satellite being released. And we put this video on the web on the night of that day. And by morning 11 o'clock, more than 100 countries had downloaded one and a half lakh downloads. And this shows the kind of curiosity this event had generated across the globe and they were looking at how a country like India is able to do this. Similarly, when you saw, for example, Chandrayaan mission. In Chandrayaan mission, though man had landed on the moon, a large number of probes had gone around the moon. The credit for discovering the process of water molecule formation and OH molecule formation and presence of these water molecules on the moon, the credit for discovery goes to Chandrayaan 1. And this is indeed a very significant development. Similarly, when we had a Mars mission, and this was a mission which definitely gives you lessons, like I was pointing out to you, that if you do not learn from your own mistake, you will be called stupid. But if you can learn from others' mistake, you can be smart. And in this particular mission, it was a very difficult mission because globally only 40% success rate was there in achieving insertion of a satellite into the Mars orbit. And India became the first country in the world to actually as an individual country in its maiden attempt to put a satellite into the Mars. To appreciate the kind of complexity that existed in this mission, if you are told on the 5th of November 2013, when this satellite was launched by PSLV from Sri Harikota. What the task for the satellite was that after traveling for about 10 months, a distance of 60 crore kilometers, at the end of that period, you imagine a space in a particular location, a 50 kilometer cube. If this satellite was not inside that cube on the 24th of September 2014, morning 7.30 a.m. to the second, then we would not have been successful in achieving the insertion of the satellite into the Mars orbit. So when after traveling so much time and so much distance, the type of forces that could have deviated the trajectory of this satellite was even sunlight falling on the satellite. You know that sunlight falling on any object produces radiation pressure. So such sunlight when it is falling on the satellite during the course of these 10 months could have deviated its trajectory beyond that 50 kilometer cube. Not only that, you need to make sure that your communication with the satellite is actually very effective because till that time we had experience of only 36,000 kilometer distance and compare this with almost 400 million kilometers away. So you need to have good communication capability and on the satellite 
even if everything is working properly and if it is not looking at earth with an angular error of just two degrees then you have no way of communicating with that satellite so the time and another important aspect you need to appreciate is the satellite if you give a command from ground it takes almost 15 minutes when it is at the farthest distance and if you send a command it will react after 15 minutes and if it sends back to you the signal it takes almost half an hour many of you when you are turning on your laptops or your computer you will start feeling fidgety if it takes a few seconds or few hundreds of milliseconds to boot up now you can imagine the people sitting at the console if they have to wait for about almost half an hour to know what has happened. So because of this, you cannot wait for real-time interaction or real-time intervention to the satellite. You have to build in enough intelligence into the satellite to make sure that satellite learns about the failures that occur inside that, bring up corrective action and take corrective actions on that. So if that is not done, then the satellite will become useless. While our initial attempt was to make sure that this satellite works for a period of about six months, but the entire thing that had been planned went on so nicely that today the satellite is still working after three and a half years. And right now, of course, we are going through a period, what is called whiteout, which means like though the stars are there in the near vicinity of sun, you are not able to see during the daytime because the sunlight actually dazzles you or saturates you. Same way, the satellite is in the vicinity of sun and when you try to look at it from the ground antenna, because of the signal coming from the sun, the satellite signal gets masked and this occurs over a period of time and then subsequent to that, we will be retrieving this and we expect it to survive for many more years to come. Now what I was trying to tell you here is that these technologies of space, whether it is a satellite technology or the launch vehicle technology, all this technology has been realized indigenously. That is the most important thing. When the work was started in the early 60s, the first launch took place in the vicinity of a church and the church actually enclosure was used for assembling the sounding rocket. Same way, the satellites that were built in Bangalore, they were built in the industrial sheds to start with. And today, we have established in the country one of the world's advanced technology capabilities of building satellites, satellites which can provide us communication, navigation, as well as earth observation capability, and many sub-meter resolution imaging system which can provide very useful inputs for various monitoring activities. And all this, and one of the key things again in terms of the launch vehicle technology, if you have to appreciate that it's a technology which is not easily accessible to us because of the very nature of uh, the technology. And right from the time when the sounding rockets was brought in the form of kits, today we have built within the country, making use of a large number of industries across the India, more than 500 plus, and this capability is built. Not only are we able to launch our own satellites, but we are also in a position to launch satellites for others. And this particular development, and among this, one of the key developments was like the cryogenic engine development. Initially, when this technology was being realized, there was discussion among the, with the Russians for providing some technology transfer. But very soon, the one of the advanced countries made sure that this technology transfer does not happen and we had to depend on ourselves. And today, you will all be extremely proud that we have two versions of this cryogenic engine which makes use of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen at very low temperatures, almost like minus 250 degrees centigrade and minus 180 degrees centigrade. These fuel has to be stored and they have to be carried in the launch vehicle. And last year, we did actually the first uh, GSLV Mark III, which will be able to give us almost four ton capacity. And five consecutive missions of GSLV Mark II using our own cryogenic engine, we have launched. And today, the world actually looks at ISRO and India because th though we may be fourth or fifth among the various technologies of space elements, 
whether it is launch vehicle, satellite, or cryogenic technology, etc., everybody recognizes that India is among the top country in making use of the space technology for the benefit of the society. Like I was giving you the examples of fishermen, then the farmers, then the countries, education system, broadcasting system, remote connectivity to the patients for linking to super specialty hospitals like telemedicine or teleeducation. In all these areas, the manner in which the programs have been conceived and the programs have been developed, world recognizes that India is among the top country to bring the benefits of the technology to the society. What you really need to appreciate is, this is the key. We will have access to technology, some technology, but we will also have limitations because nobody in the world is going to be actually so charitable as to give away the best of technology to you. It's only when you build your own capability that they are ready to even discuss or share some of the thing. They also sometimes make sure that when you are on the threshold of achieving success to deviate you or to retard your progress, they will offer technologies to you. But the key thing is to build your own capability. Only when you become capable and people realize that you are capable of delivering, you will be recognized. Till that time, it is only stories. So similarly, when India developed the technology of uh, microwave remote sensing, synthetic aperture radar, agencies like NASA was ready to work with us for a program where in 2020, we are working on a program which is a $1 billion program, out of which America is spending $0.9 billion and India is spending $0.1 billion. And this satellite, a jointly developed satellite with one of the advanced technology synthetic aperture radar mission, we will be launching it using our own launcher and the data will be available to the global community. Such a recognition happened because of what was done in Chandrayaan, what was done in our own radar imaging satellite. So when people start recognizing that you are capable of doing things, they will come to you and ready to work with you, share the technologies. So this is one of the key takeaways you should understand, that unless you put in hard work and then increase your own potential and increase your own capability, then only you will become actually equal and you are ready to work with the contemporaries and peers. So this is one of the very important aspects in life. And today, what ISRO has done and demonstrated is that though there may be many constraints, resource constraints or the working conditions constraints, but in spite of all that, what ISRO has done and demonstrated to the country that it is possible to become a force to reckon with in the world, bring in a technological capability which world recognizes. And if that has happened, how has it happened? It has happened because people like you who came out of the universities from our country in the 70s and 80s, they decided to stay put in the country, work for the country, like I was telling you earlier, that if some of you want to go to the Western world today, why do you long for that? It is because you feel that the quality of life is very good there, opportunities are very good there. But then it is for us to make the country different. It is for us to make the change. Today we have demonstrated by what has been done over the period that no matter what the difficulties are, no matter what the conditions are, if you put your target, fix your target and you are ready to work, put in your hard work, and not be deterred by failures. And again, you can, you may be knowing that first attempt of our launch vehicle, whether it is SLV, ASLV, or PSLV, or even GSLV Mark I, in all of them, our first attempts were failures. But then the culture that was established in our organization was such that you should not be deterred by failures. It's only sometimes these failures which teaches you the real difficulties and the complexities of the problem you are facing. When you are ready to overcome them and then not allow these failures to affect you, that you can succeed. So today, like that, we have been able to show, for example, PSLV, which is considered as one of the 
most reliable vehicles today. You need to understand that you need to set a target for yourself, a target which you can achieve provided you are ready to put in hard work. One of the things probably some of you would like to read, a book by one of the authors, which is called actually talks about how hard work has paid, whether it is Steve Jobs, the book name of the book is called Outliers. Probably some of you are quite familiar about the Gaussian distribution. And this distribution, in any distribution, there are always outliers. That means plus three sigma, plus six sigma. So in any education system also, what is being attempted here today by Uttarakhand government and the governor, etc., is actually to move that Gaussian distribution to as far right as possible. Because there will always be people, outliers, who will outshine. But then if we bring in the mainstream to the bigger and bigger or to greater capabilities, the outlier's performance will go much greater. So it is in this manner that you need to appreciate that your own efforts actually have to improve. Then today, the world is changing at such a fast pace, the technology of yesterday actually becomes obsolete either today or tomorrow. So one of the key things we need to appreciate is like what Alvin Toffler had said, that the process of learning, unlearning, and relearning is very important. More than the content of learning, it is the process of learning that is important. Because when the technology is changing so fast, what we have learned yesterday in terms of content needs to be modified. And we need to put our memory clean and then allow it to be filled up with fresh information. And this process of unlearning and relearning is extremely important. So you need to understand that this is the essential things. Then whatever knowledge you have acquired, this knowledge, actually you, are, you have to convert it into a practical use. That is where skill comes into picture, converting the knowledge into specific applications. And this alone is not sufficient. You also need to have character to determine what you have learned what way it should be used, whether it should be used for good things or for only individual benefit or for the benefit of few. Just to give you one of the examples that as the technology advances and when you bring in newer and newer capability, many times it is not easy to comprehend all the consequences or the impacts of that. Way back in the 70s when we were visiting Russia, we were taken to a place where they had built a dam across the Orga River. And it was a hydroelectric power plant. We went there to see. We were shown in that place a fish lift. In the middle of the dam, there is a lift for catching the fish downstream, taking it upstream and leaving it. We were wondering what's happening here. There is a dam which is constructed for the electro means hydroelectric power plant. Many of you are aware that in Russia, for example, caviar, the fish egg, is one of the delicacies and it's a huge export market. What they found when they constructed this dam, the fish like Solomon, which swims thousands of miles from sea to freshwater joints to lay their eggs, their path got blocked because the Volga River had put a huge dam and these fishes were no it was not possible for them to reach the freshwater destination. And the fish egg production had come down drastically. Initially, the fishermen used to catch the fish downstream, take it upstream and leave. Then the government decided that they will put a lift and do this transportation of uh, fish from downstream to upstream. The point is that when you are trying to look for actually technological advance of uh, bringing in hydroelectric power plant, you are disrupting one of the nature's mechanisms and then you are bringing in certain difficulties. So in the same way, today when we do many technological developments, many times we really do not appreciate the, its impact and it come, we come to know of that a little later. One of the key things you need to appreciate in the world is your ability to observe things and observe nature. We can say that today all the technological advances that have happened is actually the ideas borrowed from nature, but then developed in a manner which is very different today. So if you are able to understand that this technology has both its 
good use and bad use, whether like atom bomb or atom for nuclear power or for potential destruction. So that is where your character and your so-called samskara of our country can make a difference. From the age old, the people in our country, the sages and the rishis, had told us that if the planet, life on planet has to survive, it can survive only when you have a sustainable living approach. If you exploit the resources available on the earth beyond its regeneration capability, then we will be actually depriving the future generation of life on earth. And of course, you also have heard of people trying to make the multi-planetary species, like whether it is Elon Musk, etc. But while that is one side, we definitely need to make sure that Earth remains a habitable place for the future generation. And if that has to happen, it's only through sustainable living. And if this sustainable living has to happen, it's only when we appreciate that the technological things, changes and advances that we are bringing, we should bring it in such a manner that it remains actually sustainable. And we need to bring in methods of uh, generating energy and resource usage in the country with newer capabilities. Today, science and technology is growing and growing at a pace where it is phenomenal. Quantum mechanics, quantum technologies actually is reminding us some of the things that actually our great sages were talking about, whether today's world is a real simulation world we are living in. Uh, there is a lot of discussion which is going on which some of you, I'm sure, will be spending your time and effort in understanding the complexity of this. One of the things that is being said today is like whether what we live is a real life or is it a, actually a simulation. This is the way things are going on. But we should be open and we should be open to our own heritage. And it's only when we actually test the sayings on today's scientific and technological methodology, like what you can take as you putting it against the touchstone, verifying it against the touchstone, that you can accept the veracity of statements. So you all have a great uh, future. Let me take this opportunity to remind you that you are on the threshold of a great life. You have tremendous opportunity, an opportunity where the like of which probably did not exist during the earlier decades. And it is for you to make sure that these opportunities are effectively utilized by appreciating that you need to acquire knowledge, you need to acquire, improve your skills, and you need to improve the character and appreciate how you should use the skills whether it is for your own individual benefits or for the benefit of your society and through that make India a great country of the future. So let me take this opportunity to thank the Honorable Governor of uh, Uttarakhand for giving me an opportunity to share with you some of the work what we have done and also remind you of a great future. So let me again appreciate this whole effort and wish great success in your life. Thank you very much. Any questions you have, I'm ready to